Okay, well, I thought I'd do a little slightly different style video today for the channel. Um, trying to just cover the kind of like a broad overview for, for those who, you know, maybe just got a Toyota pickup truck with a 22 RE or even maybe a 4Runner. This could cover the four, the, or the second gen 4Runners that have the 22 RE. You know, maybe you know a little bit about motors and cars and fixing stuff, but you don't, you don't specifically know too much about the 22 RE. And this was the case with me when I originally got my truck, and you can see it here on the screen. I've, I've cobbled together a few uh, pictures, which we'll be going through uh, as part of this video. And, you know, maybe you've been watching Scotty Kilmer, and, and, or you've owned a, a more recent vehicle, uh, perhaps with a V8 or a V6, and, you know, you, you see Scotty talking about planned obsolescence with, with cars, and you're like, well... You know, it might be cheaper just to get an older Toyota than to get a really advanced OBD2 reader, you know, <laughs> to figure out what's going on. And so you are either thinking about or you have taken the leap into getting, you know, some sort of 90s Toyota and you've done your research and, and you've decided, you know what, a four-cylinder might be a lot easier to change the spark plugs on. And... um I'm getting a little tired of having to take off the entire top half of the motor to, you know, keep my car running for my wife or myself or, or whatever. And so you decide, yeah, a four-cylinder rear-wheel drive, ideally with a manual transmission, might be where it's at for the next few years. And, uh, you know, so you go out and you start you start looking around. And that's exactly kind of what I did. I've had lots of different cars. If you look at my channel there... Uh, you know, I, I, I've always been a car guy ever since I was young. My, my first car, I had to rebuild the motor on it. It was a 1966 Mustang. And uh, despite the fact that I, you know, I have owned a few Ferraris and done things, I, I came from a fairly, uh, you know, lower middle class family. We had to watch the thermostat, you know, because we couldn't afford to heat the house and uh, my mom used coupons and stuff. And so when it came time for me to get a, a, a car, I basically inherited my father's blown up 1966 Ford Mustang with a 289 four barrel and a, I think it was a C4 Ford transmission. Uh, the family pawned that off onto me after the motor blew up to level the playing field because they had got, bought my little sister a car. So I come from having to keep my vehicles running myself. And uh, as a byproduct of that, I, I know a fair deal about automotive engineering. And I can pretty much do you know, everything myself uh, from A to Z, rebuilding engines and stuff. So, But to get back on topic here... Uh, there's a lot of great things about the older 90s Toyotas uh, and the values over the last 10 or, or so years have been steadily increasing because people are starting to come to the realization that, you know what, a, a simple analog vehicle has a lot of benefits uh, it, when you need reliable transportation. And... um. I won't get into the pros and cons of electric vehicles and the environment and stuff, but but you know let's just let's just say it like this: you know, uh, electricity and lithium batteries don't just fall out of the sky; those have to be produced and they have an impact on the environment. Um, and so, having an an older vehicle that is very simple and reliable, there's a lot to be said for that, and so. I've, I've really uh, sold all my other vehicles, and I've scaled down for now to just my Toyota pickup, which you see here. Now, this photo here, photo number one, is a photo I snapped on the evening that I purchased the truck. And I'll, uh, I'll explain just a little bit about how, how I got this, this truck. Um, and uh, 
This video is probably going to run long, so you know if you're looking for a, a three-minute YouTube video, <laughs> you've come to the wrong channel. Okay, I'll just I'll just say it like that. I'm not known for my my brief, concise, to the point, short videos. In any event, I decided originally to buy this truck to just haul firewood around my property, and I was going to put a winch on on the front here. And use this to skid logs out of the forest and chop them up with my chainsaw and throw them in the back and, and heat my house, you know. And so I thought, you know, I just need a $500 truck. And this was, let's see, it, today it's 2022, the end of 2022. We're in October here. So this would have been about four years ago, you know. This would have been like 2018. And I just thought, I just need an old truck. It doesn't, nothing, doesn't need to be anything fancy. And I start looking around and... <clears throat> I thought, yeah, I should be able to find these things in droves for 500 bucks. And I was kind of shocked when I went on Craigslist and I noticed that people were asking three and four thousand dollars for for basically what I would consider a complete rust bucket, you know. And I finally emailed one of the guys. I was like, I, did you actually is did you mean to put down three hundred and fifty dollars because your truck is like gutted? And you're asking thirty five hundred. I just don't get it, you know. And and I said I don't understand why there's not more five hundred dollar used Toyota pickups. And the guy the guy was nice enough to write back and say, well, you know, these trucks are very desirable because people turn them into rock crawlers, and they're very you know they're bulletproof trucks. And and even at thirty five hundred dollars, even though my truck's gutted and it's rusty. That's actually kind of a screaming deal because, you know, I've got front lockers and I did a solid axle swap and, you know, I've got a rear e-locker and, you know, I've got, I welded a cage in and, and I've got 37s and, and it was like he was, as much as I know about cars, it was like he was speaking Japanese to me because I I was, you know, I've always been over in kind of the performance low rider sort of, you know, uh, area of cars, not so much the um the you know the four by four toyota truck this is <clears throat> excuse me this is actually my first truck i've ever had and one of the reasons i wanted to buy it was because i used to be a Datsun guy and um and and that led me into having nissans and infinities and i just got tired of the fact that those cars uh don't get very good gas mileage and nothing you do to them will really get them to get good gas mileage and so i thought you know what i'm gonna find myself a toyota pickup and and then just kind of learn all about it anyways i finally found this this guy on craigslist in our town who was selling this this particular white truck and at first, I, I actually, I wrote to the guy, he wanted like a thousand dollars, you know, and everybody else wanted a couple thousand dollars for this same sort of truck. And I, and I emailed with a few different people on Craigslist. This particular person here, um, you know, they, they said the truck was in fair condition and um, it had 300,000 miles on it. <sighs> the tags were expired. It was, it was you had like some DMV back fees and you know basically just as is so I wrote to the guy and was like hey I want to you know check out your truck man and he and he said in his ad only email you know no phone number nothing and I, and I wrote I emailed back and forth with the guy he originally said his name was Phil and <coughs> excuse me and and he was very kind of it was very difficult to 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 coordinate with him he didn't want to give me his phone number, you know, uh, and I was like, okay, I guess that's fine, you know, and he didn't want, he, I kept saying, can I come see the truck, can I come see the truck, no, not now, no, I, I'll send it, can you send me a picture of the motor, no, I can't do that, and I was like, okay, does the truck really exist, yes, it exists, I said, okay, but, and you do want to sell it, right, yes, and I said, you know, uh, like this would work a lot better if I could come see it, you know, he's like, oh, you, no, I don't have, I can't show it to you, and I said, well, what, you know, what's your phone number? Well, I don't want to give that out, you know. Said, oh, Jesus, you know. And at the time, I was, my girlfriend at the time, um, uh, 
I, I told her, I said, I think this is some sort of Nigerian complex confidence scam or something. You know, I, I don't think, I'm pretty sure this truck doesn't exist. You know, I started looking more closely at the different photos and I was like, look, that's, I don't think that's even the same truck in photo number one and number two, you know? And I said, I, you know, and I kept, but yet the guy, Phil, quote unquote, Phil, he kept emailing me back. And I was like, okay, well, I mean, at least the guy emails me back, you know? And weeks and weeks and weeks went went by. I think we were in six weeks. And the guy kept putting me off, you know? And I was like, yeah, eh, this truck definitely doesn't exist. Because why would somebody put an ad on Craigslist and then spend a month emailing with you, but you never could, you could never go see the truck, you know? And I told the guy, I got cash. I'll come buy it right now, you know? He's like, oh, yeah, well, okay, maybe next week. I don't know. Finally, I was at the mall one day just tooling around and I get it. I get it. I, I, hap- I just happened to randomly look at my phone. Holy, holy cow. I got an email from this, this guy, Phil. And he writes and he's like, okay, uh, here's my number. I'm ready to show you the truck. And by the way, my name's not Phil. It, it's Terry or some Terrence, I think. And I show my, my friends, you know, my girlfriend and her sister and stuff. I was with them and I said, I got to go right now. I got got to go. This guy is for real. I jumped in the car. Uh, I was in the Ferrari, actually. I jumped in the Ferrari, drove across town, to, and this guy just told me, you know, meet me at this corner. I was like, gee, this sounds a little sketch, you know. So I I cruise over the corner. I park. Nobody's around. He texts me, okay, I'll pull up in a while in a truck, you know, and I'm thinking... Ah, this might be this is a lot how every episode of cops starts you know <laughs> and i'm thinking you know yeah i don't know this is a little at least it's daylight outside and we're not you know in a bad part of town so i think okay i'll, I'll roll with it so i'm standing on the street corner looking around and i happen to look over and sure enough in this little rickety carport i see this truck and oh my god it's just it's it's in pretty bad shape you know i go over and i look at it and about then uh, Terry rolls up, you know, in his big, big, uh, lifted truck. And he's like, and I said, is that, are you Terry? He's like, yeah. He's like, is that your Ferrari over there? I said, oh yeah. He's like, oh yeah. Okay. Let me park, you know? So we get out, super nice guy. And I said, what, you know, what's the story on the truck and all? And, uh, he's like, yeah, you know, I I can't remember the whole deal, but it, it was like, oh, my mom, owns it but she doesn't drive it or something so I, I go over and look at it and man oh man I mean you can see from the photos this is the first the next day and the seat you know was was falling apart the truck had a kind of an odd smell for for many years I referred to it as as a dead stripper slash prostitute smell <laughs> it wasn't bad it was just different, you know what I mean? There's still a hint of that smell to this day. And oddly, as much as I don't like smells in, you know, my home or, or my environment, the, the dead prostitute smell kind of actually is not that bad. It's kind of like, you know how strippers always have a lot of perfume on them and, and stuff? And, and and normally you wouldn't want to be around somebody, you know, with a lot of chemicals and perfumes on. But, but yet the strippers always have like a super amazing smell. So you kind of give them a pass. Like, oh, you smell amazing. You know what? Yeah, I'll take a lap dance. And so my truck kind of has that smell. But if the stripper was murdered and left in the truck in, in the high heat for like two days. So it's not as good. Anyways, I, okay, I'm getting off track. The point is, is if you guys have seen my truck, right? It it looks pretty decent, I think pretty presentable on, on the channel, but I've gone through a lot of work, okay, to get it to where it's at. For one thing, I ripped this carpet out and threw it away immediately, and I and I took this seat out and I had to reupholster it up upstairs in the kitchen. I did the SR5 dash upgrade as quickly as I could because driving a manual car with no tachometer is like purgatory you know and but but to get back on track here here's the deal so you you've decided to go down this same path and you've bought a a a toyota with a 22 re and you and you pop the hood and you're like oh what this shit is bananas man what what do you what is all this like i thought the v6 were with 
plug number three being a nightmare to change was bad. What what is what is going on here? And you're just like, okay, I think this is a good idea. And that guy named Ray Nada has a clean twenty two RE, so you know I think we're still on the right page. So here you are, you've got yourself a 22 RE and you don't know what the F is going on under the hood. All right, so if you made it this far in the video, what I'm gonna attempt to do here is kind of walk you through, you know, like what is going on with all these hoses, man? And how exactly does this motor motor function and, and like what 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 should I do here? Okay, <clears throat> so let me take a sip of my coffee here. So so let's just kind of let's just kind of try. I guess let's try to try to stand back here a little bit and look at this from the standpoint of kind of what are the major systems now. If you look through my other videos, I, I have some specific videos where I cover the electrical system and I cover the function of the smog and, and stuff, but I'll try to hit it here again. But I, if if you're serious about, you know, getting on top of how the 22RE works and servicing it and all those kinds of things, and you probably already know it's a pretty durable little motor, and that, that's a byproduct of it just being very simple, you know. Um... So let me try to hit the, the big point. So obviously it's a four-cylinder, as we know. Um, if we jump ahead a little bit and, and look at this picture, you can see it, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a single overhead cam. With a, with, generally speaking, it has a single timing chain in the 89 through 95 model year. So because it's a... Uh, because it's a, a a fuel injected motor, it's called the 22RE. Now they also have the 22R and they have the 20R and I believe there's an 18R. You can you can go to Wikipedia online and you can kind of uh, research the history of the the, the this particular uh, Toyota four cylinder engine. But it's a it has a single cam and it has rocker arms. Okay. And then it actuates on this side exhaust valves and on this side intake valves. And then it has a timing chain that goes down through here. You can see here, this is where the uh, inlet for the for the water pump is. It, there's a little passover uh, thing here that brings water up from, from the radiator. Uh, obviously I have it disassembled a little bit here. I was doing service. But the water comes in here, go, goes through here, and then gets pumped into the block and distributed out. Uh, cooling through the the jackets on on the the block and so forth. Uh, this is the oil pump down here, and then the uh, the mechanical fan bolts on here. This is uh, the distributor. Although it's not a classic distributor like you'd find in an old Ford Mustang or something, or or an Oldsmobile. This is, this is uh, the truck has. Um, there's no points. Okay, it has more or less electronic ignition, and the distributor is basically triggering when to fire the spark plug. So, so that's what's going on in here. Um, and the spark plugs are super easy to access. That's one of the big benefits, I think, of the 22RE. Uh, I can literally pull my plugs out in 30 seconds flat. Uh, you know, just with a with a three eighths uh, wrench and a and a spark plug socket. Uh, here you'll see there's a little bit of an air injection thing happening, which I'll cover in a moment. Uh, this is the factory uh, cast iron manifold. I highly recommend that unless you're building a, a you know a racing car or or you really want to just squeeze out every ounce of performance from the 22RE, I highly recommend you consider st sticking with the cast iron manifold and then just maybe run yourself a two or two and a half inch uh, stainless um, exhaust down the back there. And uh, unless you are really into you know building race motor sort of stuff um or you're trying to get every possible uh horsepower out of the motor uh try to resist the temptation of putting headers on uh putting a header excuse me on your on your 22re it'll just make it loud and kind of is a pain in the butt uh if you do decide to install a header the far and away the best one uh, on the market is from a company called lc engineering and they have a two-wheel drive uh long uh kind of uh primary tubes uh, header. Uh, I'll see if I can put the link in the description once I post the video. 
and um, it's ceramic. It's stainless steel and ceramic coated. It's about five hundred bucks, and uh, it's a little bit tricky to to fabricate on uh, the rest of the exhaust system, but it does bolt on real nice up here, and it gives you a nice looking header. Uh, last time I checked, it was uh, California Re uh, Resource Board legal, with uh, what's known as an executive order, uh, an EO number stamped right on the flange, which is uh, smog legal stuff. Um, <clears throat> but usually when you're met with this kind of stuff up here you're like whoa what's going on you know so let's uh let's step back a little bit and and kind of think about what's going on here on the 22r e okay so obviously you've got the exhaust going out this side you've got the uh you've got the intake system right here so this is the air cleaner over here there's a little pipe that uh, brings air from the front of the engine through here down here up through a filter and then up through this thing. So uh, what the heck is this? So on modern cars, they monitor the amount of air going into the engine so that the computer can compute, you know, an approximate air fuel ratio. Um, some of my other videos I get into all that and the stoichiometric and all that stuff, but I'll, it's beyond the scope of this video. All you need to really know is that this is the way that the 22RE um, meters or measures the amount of air flowing through this tube and going into this upper intake plenum and that allows the computer to know how much air is coming into the engine and therefore how much gas to uh, in inject using the fuel injectors which are you'll see it later here in the video it's on a rail down here now inside here and if you have any experience with with uh, later vehicles, you know generally speaking, this is handled with what's known as a a mass airflow or an MAF sensor, and that's a wire that heats up and cools down relative to airflow over it, and based on uh, resistance and and ele uh, electrical flow, they can determine the amount of um, air entering the motor. That's not what this is. In fact, when I first bought my truck, I thought that's what this was, and I promptly unscrewed this and yanked it out and destroyed my first airflow meter. So don't do that. Um, what this is, is, and if you see some of my other videos I cover, it, there's a little door in here. So you can kind of see this little kind of curve. Well, that's where a door flops open uh relative to air flowing through this this hose uh, this intake pipe and um based on how much air is flowing it pushes that door open there's a little potentiometer in here and that tells the computer hey this is how open the door is and that lets the the computer the ecu which is uh by the way under kind of over to the right of your glove box on that kick panel is where the ecu is and that's the only computer on the car and it's a very solid state kind of uh, you know, a uh, well-made kind of computer, so you don't need to worry about that too much. Um, but in any event, the this thing here is basically just a door with a potentiometer that tells it, hey, this is, the door's open this far. The only other thing in here, and again, I have other videos that cover this in great, much greater detail. The only other thing to know about this is that when that door pops open, that is a signal to the computer or actually not the computer so much as a relay which uh, turns on your fuel pump so again other videos which cover that in more detail but that's something to be aware of is that this door has the function of turning on and off your fuel pump once the engine is is running so that's always something to keep in mind now this hose here that you see kind of this crazy crossover hose that goes down into this little uh, round kind of canister looking thing well what that is is that is part of what's known as the AS system and that stands for the air suction system so um, on the 22 RE you you have kind of two big uh, smog systems at work let me see if I can find a picture here okay yeah so if you look at the back right here see this little guy that is a vacuum actuated valve which is known as the EGR valve and that stands for the exhaust gas recirculation so it's controlled by this little thing up here that little 
purple label with all the, the vacuum hoses. And, and what this is, is it is a vacuum modulator. And what it does is it, it sort of, you can kind of think of it like this, it sort of combines the pressure that is present in the exhaust system with the vacuum that's present in the intake manifold and it sort of balances those two in such a way that at certain times it will crack open this valve and there's like a little valve down here and that valve allows exhaust gases to flow um, from the cylinder head exhaust, which is over on this side, and there's kind of a passageway on the back, and, you, and you'll notice sometimes there's a plate. If you look around in the back, you can see there's a plate bolted to the back of the cylinder head. That's actually covering a water jacket, and that water jacket back there brings exhaust gases kind of and routes them through the back of the cylinder head and crosses over to this EGR valve that bolts back here. And then the EGR valve has a little, uh, tube that comes up and comes right in here okay and this little uh, temperature sensor is responsible for monitoring the temperature of those gases flowing down a little tube that's inside the roof of this intake plenum and so basically what it does is it it's when this EGR valve opens up it will allow it'll bleed off some of the exhaust gases and reburn them by by bleeding them in here and uh drawing them back in into the motor and then of course this is your throttle body over here so um if you were to remove the uh, exhaust manifold you'd see some little holes that allow some of the exhaust gases to, to recirculate and that's a smog thing which which helps uh, I mentioned it in the one video and I'll put the link in the description uh, it, it, it's relative to the uh, the different systems and how they function uh, it basically bleeds a little bit of inert um, exhaust gases in to, to help gas mileage and cool down the cylinder and so forth so that's kind of what what that is and some of this stuff back here um, and then it's the whole show is controlled by the exhaust gas uh, uh, or or the vacuum modulator right here. Now, when you go get a smog check, see that see that little hose right there. If you pull that hose off and and put a vacuum on that, it will crack open the EGR valve, which will suddenly let a large amount of ex exhaust gases into the intake system, and it'll cause the the truck to start to stall out because you're swamping it with exhaust gases as opposed to bleeding in a little bit of exhaust gases as you're cruising down the highway. So when you go get a smog check on, on your 22RE, they're going to check to make sure that this functions. They're also going to pull a vacuum on this uh, vacuum modulation valve to make sure that it it's functioning uh, as well because it's kind of a, there's a little bit of a balancing act in there. And you can you can take this apart and clean it to a certain degree and and check it uh in the in the factory shop manual uh which I'll get to in a minute um they they give all the steps on how to to uh, test that and 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 so forth so and then uh while we're talking about smog stuff this right here is your PCV valve that's the positive crankcase ventilation valve and it had uh, inside the uh, valve cover there's a, a baffle system and this valve is responsible for drawing in uh, blow-by gases and, and moisture which develops inside the, the motor as a result of blow-by past the piston rings and, uh, and then reburning it in, in here. So um, I have extensive videos on some of the problems I've had with my oil valve system, but again, that's beyond the scope of this particular video. I'm just trying to kind of get you get help you get your bearings as far as what the heck is going on on this 22re stuff okay so this right here is the uh, and this is my motor by the way i uh, i'll interject here this is what my engine looked like uh, pretty much the first couple weeks that i bought the truck um okay see this right here this uh is a it's you can sort of think of it like a fifth fuel injector 
And what it is, is it's a cold start system. So when the, when the motor is cold in the morning and you crank it over, this uh, primes things a little bit by, by uh, putting a little additional gas in to get the show on the road. Um, it's actually a hard, there's actually a hard line. Let me see, I don't know if I have an angle that shows it a little better. Uh, you can kind of see there's a banjo uh, bolt, as I remember in here. And this is a hard line that actually goes right over to the uh, fuel rail. So this is pressurized with, with fuel, and then this uh, harness here is responsible for turning that on when you start the truck up. Now, another thing you might want to be aware of is on the bottom of your uh, throttle body, which is this, this affair here, there is what's known as the idle air control valve. And that's something that gives people a lot of problems. I have a couple of videos dedicated to just that on my channel. And um, it, even though there's a lot of vacuum hoses going to this thing, it's, it's pretty straightforward. In that other video, I cover it extensively, so I won't, I won't recover it here. Uh, the only thing to know is that um, the function of the idle air control valve is basically to allow extra air to come in when the engine is cold to work in concert with this fuel injection, uh, you know, uh, fuel injector here for the cold start. Once the engine starts to heat up, uh, the, the coolant flowing around the idle air control valve will shut the additional air passage off. And uh, that just, it acts kind of like a choke and helps your, your motor get started in the morning. Um, let's see, do I show it here anywhere? No, I guess I've got it taken off there. So, uh, and then this right here is your idle adjustment screw. So you can adjust this to let a little extra air or a little less air uh, flowing past the butterfly valve inside the throttle body. And that'll let you kind of turn your idle up and down a little bit there. All right, so the other system that you want to kind of be aware of. And let me see if I can find a photo here that kind of shows it in a little bit of more detail. Um, so right here, you can see you can see this little tube, okay? And at first glance, you think, well, what the heck's going on here? You know. Is this to let exhaust gas go somewhere, or what's the deal? Well, what this actually is, is this is uh, the air injection. So the way that the 22RE works is, if you remember this, this little tube right here, it allow, this is part of what's known as the air suction system. So some cars actually have an air pump which which pumps air and injects it into the exhaust stream leaving the motor in an attempt to reburn that fuel when it hits the red hot catalytic converter the way toyota handles it is with a little bit more of a passive system whereby at a certain time they open up a valve and just let air get drawn into the stream of of exhaust so it's not an actively it's not actively pumping air into the into the exhaust stream but it's allowing air to be drawn in and so if you let me see if I can find so okay yeah so see right here this this hose here you can see it goes to the other end of that kind of weird little kind of uh, canister thing and and what this is is it's uh there's a there's a reed valve in here and this is kind of i think that's kind of a silencer thing right there um and it allows air to come in through this reed valve and down this little channel and this is all bolted in under the lower uh the intake runners and you can see i've got the so right here I, this is the plenum and it bolts to the the runners which are kind of concealed when the plenum is on top you can see this is the air injection air suction thing so it lets air come in and 
go in here and then go under and then underneath this intake manifold affair is the uh, the whole air suction valve is bolted under there so that's a when you first get a 22R that's a little confusing you're like what what the heck is going on under here you know and I don't know if I have anything that really shows it in this picture but but right on the bottom of this there's a little vacuum line and that vacuum line when you apply vacuum to it um, it will crack open the air suction uh, valve and let air flow in and then it flows around the back of the cylinder head and winds up coming uh, in here into this tube and gets injected in there so and the way that that functions generally speaking is when you uh when you're driving along and you let off on the gas and you're kind of decelerating and you're under no throttle that's when it uh, the ecu kicks open the air suction and you can kind of if you listen carefully you can kind of hear it actually it kind of makes a little bit of a, a burbling noise sometimes and what that is is that's the the air suction system now you can you can actually pull this vacuum line off and and put a vacuum pump on it and open and close it yourself to uh to make to ensure that it's working so and then here you can kind of get a good shot of the egr valve by the way so this is kind of that little pipe that uh, comes up and goes into the top of the intake plenum uh, if you ever need to remove this by the way you, what you you kind of have to do is take a crescent wrench and then uh spray this with wd-40 and then kind of back this off and that'll let this little guy kind of flop backwards and then there's three bolts that hold this to the cylinder head um let's see what else while we're looking here you can see that this is where your thermostat goes on the 22re and there's the kind of a crazy little hose right here that allows coolant to flow through that idle air control valve and then where i've got this pin blocking things off is the return for it uh i don't think i have a great picture of things but you can kind of see it right here so see this little coolant hose right here um it runs down to it comes up out of the thermostat housing and it runs and circulates coolant under the lower part of this guy here and then the coolant flows back down into the hard line that runs um, from the back of the front timing chain cover to uh, to allow water to to bleed off to your to your heater. So to ensure that you're getting proper coolant flowing through this idle air control valve, which that needs to heat up and shut down once the engine comes up to temperature uh and 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 close that extra air passage so that your eye and that's what controls your idle dropping in the morning by the way so when you start your 22 re the idle is high and then as it warms up you'll see it kind of settle down that that's the functioning of the idle air control valve as your coolant heats up and flows through here so to verify that that's all working all you gotta do is just wait till the motor warms up a little bit check to make sure this hose is warm and then on the bottom of the idle air control valve there's a hose that runs over here make sure that's got coolant flowing on the other side of it and that'll usually tell you you know that you don't have a a blockage here so then just to kind of recap on the 22re we've got the exhaust going out this way some of it gets bled back in and burned again through the egr valve we've got uh we've got them wanting to mix some some fresh air into the exhaust that's going to the catalytic converter through the air suction um the valve under under here all this stuff is bolted under the intake uh, runners it's responsible for opening up this this valve system here and letting air uh come in through this thing here and and then flow through the the air suction valve here back around and then up into the injector and and passively drawn in to the exhaust stream and then reburn with the catalytic converter so that kind of <clears throat> explains the, the the larger systems that work on the 22 re now while we're looking here you can also kind of see let me see if maybe i can zoom in a little bit um back here you see this is your heater core okay so if you pull the heater core out of your truck these are this is the um one of the 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 
the tubes or the, the inlets and the outlets. And then this is when you turn the the heat adjustment on your dashboard with the little red and blue kind of blending thing, th you're actually manually controlling this valve. And what this valve does is it starts to let coolant come in from the motor, depending on how much you open the valve, and there's a cable right there, and bleed it into the heater core and then circulate and, and bring it around and out and down and back uh, into the motor. Um, also visible here, you can see this is the vacuum line that goes over to the brake booster. And then there's a check valve here. So uh, let's see, what else do we need to know here? Um, so let's let's go back to the uh to all these crazy vacuum lines. Yeah, so you so you buy a 22 RE, you you pop the hood, you clean the motor off and then you're kind of left with this this craziness up here and you're like, "What? How in the world am I ever going to figure out, you know, where all these hoses go?" And when you first look at it, it it really seems kind of daunting, okay? Um and what and what you have to kind of do is you have to just just kind of dig into it and and dissect kind of the different hoses and and what in the heck is is going on with all this stuff. So let me let me try to try to break it down a little bit. Let let's start with the simple stuff, okay? So see this hose right here that that goes from the throttle body area and it goes back into the top of the valve cover right here. Okay, what that is, and I talk about this extensively in, in other videos on my channel, what this is, is this is the fresh air breather, okay? And it works in concert with the PCV valve and system. So they, on modern cars, they want to uh, have the positive crankcase ventilation system, which is, is the PCV valve right here, they want they want this constantly drawing pressurized uh, blow by gases out of the motor and they do that through the top end of the motor up here with a baffle system and so this is constantly sucking uh, fumes out of the engine when there is vacuum present uh, in the in the uh, intake plenum and and you say well when is vacuum present well when the pistons go down, they, as you probably know, they, they create a vacuum and they want to draw f air and fuel into the motor. Well, when you, when you close the throttle plate with the accelerator pedal, as you, as you block off air flowing in, it begins to create a vacuum in the engine, such as at idle or partial throttle. And that vacuum is utilized here with a little port that goes directly into the intake uh, plenum and it draws the fumes uh, very effectively out of the motor. Now, if you don't have any air coming back in to the motor, you're gonna pull a vacuum of up to, you know, anywhere between 18 and 24 inches of uh, vacuum. And just as, a, as an aside here, uh, a healthy 22RE should pull somewhere between, uh, you know, 17 and 18 inches of vacuum at idle if everything is, is going up running correctly and your your valves and your rings are okay. That's around the, the, the benchmark kind of, you know, 17 and a half is, is a good number. Uh, and you can just throw up any vacuum gauge on any of these uh, kind of ports, you know, and, and just check the vacuum. Um, if you have anything less than about 16, I would start looking at sealing around your uh, dipstick and make sure you, none of these little hoses have come off. Uh, in any event, this hose here is the fresh air breather, which allows when you pull a vacuum with the PCV system, the PCV valve, there's got to be fresh air coming in to kind of let, let the fumes flow th through and out. So they need a fresh air breather kind of coming in. However, on a carbureted car, you can run a breather here. On a fuel injected car, you can't just slap a breather on here because what you will kind of do inadvertently is you will introduce what's known as unmetered air. And let me just explain that quickly. So as you remember, this air fuel meter 
uh, is responsible for telling the computer how much air enters into the engine. So if you follow its path, it, come, it comes through the air cleaner in here, up through the door. The door knows how much air is coming in, and it comes through here. Now, at this point, the air is what's known as metered air. The, the car and the computer are aware approximately of how much air we're dealing with. Now, if some of that air is diverted through this breather and it finds its way down in the engine and then is drawn subsequently back out through the PCV system and then brought in here and burned, that's, as far as the computer and the, and the fuel injection system is concerned, that's as good as air just coming right through the the uh, throttle body. It knows about the volume of it and it doesn't really care whether it came this way directly or if it took a little detour, sucked up some bypass uh, blow by gases and came this way. It's all been accounted for. However, if you take this fresh air breather hose off and you put a, a breather that's uh, exposed to the atmosphere like one of those little K&N kind of guys what you're now doing is you're allowing air to come in through that which has not been accounted for by this meter over here and air coming in through there will ultimately be drawn in through here and introduced into the intake system and that's what's known as unmetered air and to a fuel injection system which has a computer and a fuel table that's attempting to accurately uh, track or, or, or control air fuel ratios inside the motor, that is, is you know, going to really throw it off. So you've got to be aware of that fact on a fuel injected engine, especially if you're coming from uh, carbureted motors. Now on a carbureted engine, uh, it doesn't really care because uh, there's no computer monitoring the amount of air. So the air can come from with it wherever. But on a fuel injected engine, which is is the 22RE, you do have to have the air rooting through the the AMF, the air fuel meter, and coming through this way. So be very careful about slapping on a breather there. I, you can introduce a lot of weird airs. Um, anyways, where were we? We were talking about kind of all these hoses. So let's break these down. So that's the fresh air breather. It, it just lets metered air get into the engine. That right there is the uh, PCV system. It sucks uh, blow by gases out of the engine. Uh, this little hose here is, that, that plugs in under the, the PCV is the uh, vacuum port or vacuum source for the brake booster um, and then you've got uh, this little guy here it's nothing fancy it's just basically they they're ganging multiple ports into this is it's not doing anything very much more than just giving you multiple ports and that has to do with this uh, vacuum modulator um, let's see there was something else I was gonna mention here oh uh, over here you can see right here uh, and let's let's skip a a little bit further down here you can see here where I've taken off while working on the the motor I've taken off the upper plenum and this shows the fuel rail okay so now this fuel rail let me zoom in just a little bit here so this fuel rail has a couple different things going on right here is the inlet the, the this is a pressurized fuel inlet and if you follow this hose down here, it will go down here and bolted to the side of the block uh, is a fuel filter. Now, if you have a 22RE that has a couple hundred thousand miles, or in my case, my motor, my truck actually had 400, uh, 437,000 miles. I don't know how many mo miles were on the engine itself, but if you're dealing with a high mileage 22RE, and most people are because it's a 30 something year old vehicle, one of the first things I would recommend doing is getting yourself a an OEM Toyota uh, fuel filter and replacing it because the one that's on the truck is going to be pretty dirty. It's probably not going to be dirty enough to cause any problems, but it's just nice to have a clean fuel filter in my opinion. And it bolts in under here. It's not too hard to get off, but uh, it, it can be a little bit tricky. Um, the let's see here where are we um oh so the fuel rail okay so this fuel rail bolts in with these two little uh 
I think they're eight millimeter, uh, long eight millimeter bolts. It it clamps down on the fuel injectors, and I don't know. You can kind of see the fuel injectors peeking out there. Uh, one thing also is you you, you, you want to make sure that your fuel injectors are f all firing. Oh, here's a fuel injector right here. So it just has a little harness on it. Um, you want to make sure your fuel injectors are all firing. One of the easiest ways to do that is just pull these uh, electrical connectors off and see if the motor changes. And that'll kind of give you a little bit of a picture on whether the fuel injectors are change, uh, are firing. You can also take a rubber tube and and put it by your ear and listen to see if you hear these clicking. Uh, that's the other way to do it. On my particular motor, I had, I had problems because I think two out of the four fuel injectors, or maybe it was three out of the four fuel injectors were either failing or in the process of failing. Uh, I, en I ended up changing mine over to some Bosch injectors. Uh, in hindsight, I kind of wish I had gone with the Toyota injectors. Uh, when I changed my injectors, I, I really didn't know uh, a terrific amount about injectors. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, the bottom line is that the factory injectors are very good. They have two holes. Uh, the Bosch injectors have four, and they get a little little bit better spray. But Okay, so here you can kind of see also that the banjo bolt and the hard line that goes up to that uh, coal start injector uh, stuff that I was showing earlier. Um, and then you have a larger banjo fitting here, which is your supply line in. Now, the 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 Toyota 22RE has a mechanical fuel pump, which is is powered in and is inside the gas tank. Um, it supplies approximately 43 psi, but at some points, such as idling, uh, Toyota decided it was necessary to drop that pressure down a little bit. And so that's what this thing right here does on the back of the fuel rail. It, it is a a vacuum controlled fuel pressure regulator that basically when you have high vacuum at idle it cracks open and dumps some of the pressurized gas out through this little return line here and if I if I'm not mistaken that return line just snakes its way back to the gas tank actually now so if you look at under the the frame rails you'll see two lines going back and forth uh, to the gas tank and one of those is um, I believe one of those is a return line uh, one of them may be a vent line uh, it, uh, I, I think that's right I, I'd have to crawl under there and look but you get the basic idea now where I'm going with this is this vacuum line is controlled by what's known as a VSV. And I cover this in, in one of my other videos, but VSV stands for Vacuum Switching Valve. And basically what it is, and you can see the three of them picture here, and we're gonna cover them in a second. What these VSVs do is they're just, uh, if you apply 12 volts to them, they just are, uh, it's just a, a, a vacuum switch. It's a, it's a solenoid that opens a vacuum passage. And Toyota utilizes these to control some of the different systems on the truck. Now, the good news is that this particular VSV, which has a vacuum line that goes up here, uh, it's, it basically works whereby when the vacuum level is high, it reduces the fuel pressure in the, in the fuel regulator. And, and it has a, a, a vacuum switching valve to let the ECU control that. But if you, if you think about it, basically any time the vacuum levels are low, you know, you, you want the, the fuel pressure to be low. Now, the, the one possible exception to this is under full throttle, but uh, maybe next time I go full throttle in my truck, I'll look and see if the vac if the if the fuel pressure drops. But uh, I don't think it ever has. But um, the the point is, is you can kind of just bypass this whole VSV and, and knock down one of these guys at least, and then just run this vacuum line directly to the the intake manifold uh, uh, vacuum source. So that's that's what I've done on my truck. Now, if you look at the top of the motor here. So we've kind of covered this one here, 
and we've covered this guy here and we've covered this guy here and then all the vacuum lines that go here and all this you can kind of figure them out okay that's the vacuum line that controls the EGR valve this is these are all the vacuum lines that are responsible for the uh, vacuum modulation in conjunction with the pressure of the um, exhaust gases uh, let's see what else we got here um, this one here if you follow it over here it goes to this weird little thing next to bolted next to the distributor and uh, it is a uh, I can't remember exactly but it I believe this is a fuel I think they call that a fuel up uh, valve or some darn thing and you can see there's one vacuum line that goes in and then there's one vacuum line that comes out and um, kind of if I if I'm not mistaken that is involved with the uh, power steering so that so when you go full lock you put kind of an extra strain on the power steering pump and that extra strain starts to want to cause the engine to die, you know, because you're putting kind of more of a strain on the pump. And the pump is driven by the, the, the front of the crank uh, pulley stuff there. So uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, it, this thing, which I took off and threw away, by the way, with my power steering system. But as I recall, uh, what it does is it kind of allows uh, more air to get in kind of to simulate cracking open the throttle a little bit to offset that that kind of load that's being placed on it uh, but that's what those hoses are there are there for now there's a big plate that's bolted on top of the the motor which which these VSVs and vacuum hoses sit on and there's kind of a, a funky I don't know if you can see it right in here there's kind of a funky metal manifold that these hoses all go into now me personally if you look at some of the other videos on my channel you can see that I I took uh, these two VSV valves and I moved them and I bolted them into that little hole right there on on the um, on the fender uh, well and and I did that because I'm often taking off the valve cover and having all this stuff living on top of it is a real drag so let me cover kind of what these are just in an effort to help kind of you know so, so it doesn't seem so overwhelming. So you can see in this particular photo, I've actually, I was actually in the process of trying to understand what these different things are. And so I've actually written down on them kind of what they, which ones they are. So I, I can kind of make heads or tails out of this. So if you look at this one, this is the fuel PSI. And that was the one I was just discussing, uh, which goes to that little, uh, on the back of the fuel rail, that little uh, uh, pressure regulator, and it is responsible for letting for the ECU allowing vacuum to run over that and drop the fuel pressure at idle, basically. So then, what I did was I just I read on one of the Toyota forums that somebody said, you know, I think you could just run the the vacuum line directly and get rid of this, and I was like, okay, I'm in, good enough for me. So I took this off, and then I just ran the the vacuum line from from the manifold. Uh, back to that directly to that uh, fuel pressure regulator and I've never had any problems so uh, the truck runs phenomenally well uh, without this so I just took this off and basically threw it away okay now this is the air suction system so AS stands for air suction and that was if you remember the thing I was discussing over here which allows the um, air to c come flowing in through this little guy here in here get wrapped around the back of the cylinder head uh, and then into the exhaust stream to help reburn uh, the emissions. So there has to be a vacuum line, a vacuum supply that knows when to put a vacuum on this this little valve to to start letting air uh, bleed in to get over to the exhaust system. And that's what uh, the AS valve does here. The, the, and this is the the a the air suction VSB. And you can see it has two vacuum lines and it has a check valve. So I forget which way it, it goes. I think the check valve goes to the manifold. Um, and that's and this is to perfect. In case of a, a backfire, they don't want pressure going backwards here and maybe messing up the air suction valve. Um, and then it's got a this little thing hanging off here. You're like, what the, what the heck is that? Well, that's just kind of a 
an, an air inlet. So you can actually pop this off and there's just a little, it's basically just an air filter, a dinky little air filter that lets air come in so that when they, when they shut off the air suction, it, it will relieve the vacuum and let the, the air come in and allow that, uh, that, that uh, air suction valve to, to close back down. So you can take this and, and relocate it somewhere else. Just get some four millimeter uh, vacuum hoses and, and you can kind of put this wherever you want and get it off this crazy plate here. Now this one here is the EGR valve and we've already discussed that. That's the vacuum supply right here, which ultimately uh, puts a vacuum on this tube, the little metal tube here that pulls the valve up and lets the exhaust gases cross over and, and get burned. And and this so this is the source of that vacuum and the computer the ECU in the car uh, will send a signal when it wants to recirculate exhaust gases and and open this VSV valve and that will allow vacuum from the manifold to find its way through the modulator over to the EGR valve and thus let uh, exhaust gases start to to uh, be bled off now you can also relocate that one as as long as you uh, keep everything you know hooked up the same and just extend the hoses and that will ultimately free up all this stuff you can take this plate off and throw it away you can take the uh, little metal tubing things and, and and toss that in the trash and that will get most all of this stuff off the top of the valve cover which will not only make your life a lot more simple when it comes to things like adjusting the valves, but it, it cleans, it does a great job of cleaning up the motor. Um, and it, and it really makes understanding what in the, the F is going on up here a lot, a lot easier to digest when you break it down into kind of the, the little individual system. Now, the only thing we, we haven't really discussed is kind of this, this stuff over here. Now, let, let me see if I can kind of, cover that um so if you watch my video where i take the the throttle body off and i discuss this stuff you'll you'll see that i kind of say when i'm trying to explain what's going on internally here with all the hoses and ports and stuff, i i basically say you can ignore this whole side and that's pretty much true so this one is the is the fresh air breather this is that crazy kind of uh our power steering is full lock we need some more you know uh RPMs to keep the motor from dying. Now, this these four little guys over here, um, they are kind of the vacuum supply to the the EGR stuff, as I recall. So if you if you look at um, if you kind of trace where they go here, uh, these guys here. If you look on these little circles that are stamped on or cast into the throttle body, they have like E, R, um, G, and, and P and stuff. So you can trace those back. Uh, and before you start yanking these hoses off, that's, it's not a bad idea to mark these uh, vacuum hoses where the, the front and the rear. So um, if you look also on the on the underside of the hood there's actually a, a good little diagram that shows kind of how these hoses route but the basic idea is if you look on this uh, vacuum modulator you'll see some of the letters you know e and r and p and stuff and those correspond uh to to these guys these three as i recall now this one here the one that says p what it is is it is actually a a hose that runs over to this affair. So it terminates over here. Let me see if I can catch another picture of it. Uh, well, I, I don't have a, a good shot that shows the whole thing, but you you can pop your hood if you got a 22R and you can kind of see. So this right here, this is what's known as an EVAP canister. And I covered it in one of my other videos about small hoses and all that. Uh, it basically is a uh, it is a canister where fumes that are in your gas tank go. Okay, so when the gas tank gets hot during the summer or cold at night, you have an expansion and contraction which pushes out uh, gas fumes, and so in an effort to you know keep the environment. Uh, 
you know, uh, the EPA and, and the environment and everything, keep, keep smog down and what have you, they don't want those exhaust gases being vented out to the atmosphere the way it was done back in the 60s and 70s. So the gas tank is a sealed thing. That's why when you take off your gas cap, you hear that kind of whoosh, you know. That's because it's a, it's a, it's a pressurized kind of vacuum uh, sealed system between the gas tank and the motor. Well, so there has to be somewhere for the gas fumes in the gas tank to, to go so that on a hot day, your gas tank doesn't explode. But yet also... Uh, on a cold day, when things contract, that your gas tank doesn't squish itself, you know, and 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 collapse. So that's what this does. Uh, that's what the function of this is. And this is a a an activated charcoal canister. And if you hacksaw this open, you'll just get a a bunch of uh, charcoal like you would find, you know, in a in a in a fish tank filter system basically now there's videos out on the internet where they people show cutting this open and they dump out the 20 year old car, uh, carbon uh, charcoal and then they light it on fire and then it what it does is it burns out years and years and years of of gas fumes that have gotten into all the surface area of the of the activated charcoal and what you're doing with that and i've done that you got to be super duper careful by the way you burn your you burn your garage down if you're not careful. What you have to do is is cut if you're going to do it and tread lightly if you do, but cut this thing open and dump out all the charcoal inside of it. First watch the other videos because you you want to see how kind of crazy it is before you attempt it yourself or you burn your, you know, your eyelashes off. Uh you you but you can cut this thing open you can dump all the charcoal out into like a barbecue, an empty barbecue or a stainless steel pan or something, and you can set the damn thing on fire. Now, it, it, it'll little, literally have flames six or eight feet up in the air, so you got to be super careful when you do this. The way that I did it is I dumped out all the charcoal and I broke the amount of charcoal down into 10 different smaller batches, and then I just did each one tenth of the charcoal and I re and I burned all the fuel out of it and I used a blowtorch to do that and I reactivated it and then I built myself another canister and put it all back in and, and hooked this all back up. But that's what this is. It's the EVAP canister and there's a purge port right here that goes over to uh this little port right here and it's responsible for kind of providing a suction to that that evap canister at all times to try to draw out the uh extra fumes and residual vapors and things uh from from that evap canister and thus the uh fuel system as a whole so that's what that is so that kind of gives you uh, you know a little bit of a roadmap to to what's going on here with all this crazy crazy business up here um let's see what else do we want to cover uh okay so uh, let's let's jump ahead a little bit. So if you have taken the plunge or you're thinking about it and you've gotten yourself a, an older vehicle uh, from Toyota, which is um, got a 22R in it, I strongly recommend that you that you you bite the bullet and you go on eBay and you buy the original shop manuals. Now, yes, you can get Chilton's manuals and I'm sure you can find a lot of stuff online and so forth. But there is no replacement for these two manuals. And um, I just grabbed the, this photo off of eBay right now. So the, these two technically, as of October 17th, 2022, are for sale. But you can see, let me see if I can get the the actual publication number there. Ah, I guess you can't. I don't know if you know. Maybe it's RM or something there. 153U2 and 153U1. So you have the engine and specifications, and then you have the chassis body electrical specifications. These are, hands down, the two most valuable manuals uh, that you can own if you have a, a, a truck, a uh, pickup truck uh, from Toyota. And this one happens to be the same year as mine. 
Um, <clears throat> I already have these manuals, so I won't be bidding uh, <laughs> on eBay against you, but uh, these are invaluable if you have just purchased a truck. Uh, these tell you uh, everything you want to know, um, and, and, and I, can't really, I, I can't really stress strongly enough how important these are if you are going to do your own service on the truck. Um, now, the other one that is extremely important is this one here, and you may or may not have seen s this particular manual featured in some of my electrical videos, but it is uh, as important, if not more so, than the previous two manuals I just showed you, the actual shop manuals, these guys. This manual here, holy cow, this thing uh, gets down into the uh, wiring harness, and I've redone the entire wiring harness on my truck, um, and this was the manual that really allowed me to understand what the heck is going on with the, the wires in my truck, basically. And it will show you the actual configuration of the pins inside of the uh, connectors. It will show you what color wire does what. Uh, it's absolutely indispensable when it comes to sorting out uh, you know, the electrical system of your truck. And 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 therefore I I can't uh, stress how, strongly enough how important it is to own this particular manual. And it's generally speaking, it's available used on eBay. Uh, you can see in in this video here. This is the wiring harness here that that comes in. And in let's see here. I guess I don't really have a, a photo that shows, but you can kind of oh yeah here. So you can see over here. This is the um, uh, the fuse box which controls it out of the car there's also a fuse box in the uh, left kick panel under the uh, steering wheel with fuses um, but this, this one has a lot of stuff this little box right here is the diagnostics port uh, generally most people use this mainly when you set the timing on the motor and you can see down here this is the timing mark let me see if I can zoom in on that a little bit so this is the timing mark on on the motor um, you set the timing by by loosening this bolt on the distributor and turning this uh, a little bit. Uh, the factory setting is five degrees, but the computer will advance the timing based on vacuum and temperature and so forth. So when you want to set the base timing, the static kind of uh, ignition timing, you have to go in here and jumper. I think it's TE and E1 or something like that, and you just take a paper clip and bend it and jumper those two. And what that when you jumper those, that signals the computer, the ECU that's back there in the kick panel, to not advance the motor and let you put a timing light on this and set the timing to five degrees before top dead center. Now, me personally, I've tried all kinds of different timing on my motor. I've tried, tried you know, three degrees, five degrees, seven, eight, ten, eleven. Um, I I run my motor at 7.5 degrees before top dead center, and I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, five degrees is also plenty good. Um, uh, I also turn up the uh, the timing, oh, excuse me, the, the, the idle, which is right here. Instead of running the idle at 750 RPMs or 800, I usually run it more like around 800 or 900. I, I have a lot better luck uh, with with that uh, idle um, given the temperature outside which is generally around 68 degrees so uh, that's a few things to understand about kind of the electrical system um, this manual is indispensable and then as far as any, anything with the chassis or the or rebuilding the motor or tuning the engine the, these two guys also are indispensable so you, you kind of got to bite the bullet and uh, pick these guys up. Uh, these usually you can get them anywhere between yeah, you know, hundred to one hundred and fifty for the for the set. Can't remember off the top of my head what I paid for mine on this, but you know, probably around fifty or seventy five bucks. Uh. Oh, and something else I wanted to kind of interject here before we go much further with uh, kind of trying to understand the twenty two re and and you know kind of uh, what to check and and the different things um, and. In kind of explaining everything here, where I don't really want to delve too far into, you know, how to specifically diagnose your 
your 22 RE for problems. I'll, I'll have other videos for that. This is just kind of an overall, you know, try to get you oriented with regard to the 22 RE. And, you know, what are these hoses and what, what are kind of the big systems, you know, going on. Uh, kind of the importance of the, the airflow meter and such. But I want I do want to specifically comment on uh, another area that is as important as the airflow meter, if not really more so. And what that is, is that's the throttle position switch. And this is a, a, a small but critical component in the motor. It, it's bolted to the left-hand side of the, the throttle body such that when you operate the butterfly valve it is being turned in unison with the butterfly valve and it is sending back a signal to the ECU to let the computer know uh, effectively where the throttle plate is and whether or not you are you know you have your foot resting on the, the accelerator. Now there's a website uh, called uh, 22RE Performance and they have a lot of great information. Um, uh, specifically, they have a diagnostics page, which uh, if you're going to be doing any work on your 22RE or you want to understand how to tune it and, and ensure that it's operating correctly, uh, I strongly recommend that you visit their website and you closely read the diagnostic info page, uh, especially as it relates to the throttle position switch. And they really uh, nail it. They say that uh, the throttle position switch being in proper adjustment is a big deal, I think they say. And, uh, and, and they, they say that it, it may be the biggest deal. And I want to echo those sentiments. Um, it, basically, if the throttle position switch on your 22R is not perfectly adjusted, and I mean perfectly, uh, then you're, it's going to have a cascade of problems kind of effect. Uh, now the, the air flow meter is equally important. It must be functioning uh, perfectly. It, there's not really much adjustment in there. Generally speaking, you don't uh, monkey around with that too much. So, but you do need to make sure that it is is opening and closing uh, with without any kind of uh, obstruction, or and that that door in there is is free to move uh, and and return back to its original position. Now, as long as that's okay, then then <clears throat> then the throttle pos position switch uh, sensor, the throttle, the TPS, it is probably the most critical thing to the overall smooth functioning of the the 22RE. This means idling, this means setting the timing, this means the the proper function of the ECU. Like I say it has a cast if it's out of whack, it is it has a kind of a cascading negative effect across the entire functioning of the 22RE. So it is something that you should should definitely uh uh, understand the importance of and understand uh, how to properly set it. Now, uh, again, it, there's a good write-up on the 22RE performance page as well as in the Toyota uh, factory service manuals. Just briefly, uh, to give you an idea, the, the throttle position sensor has to be adjusted within, I believe it's uh, 0.3 millimeters. So that's a third of a millimeter, which is around 10 thousandths of an inch, 12 thousandths of an inch. So there's basically about a, a 10 thousandths of an inch adjustment window where the throttle position sensor is properly adjusted relative to the movement of the throttle plate inside of the uh, the throttle body. So it is a an extremely, I can't stress enough how important it is and and that it is an extremely, extremely sensitive um, 
uh, adjustment to the to the overall functioning of the motor. Now, if you just go downtown and, help, and some mechanic who doesn't really know his business slaps on a new throttle position sensor and doesn't really go through the time-consuming process of, of properly adjusting it down to literally thousands of an inch, then uh, you're going to have a lot of problems getting your 22RE to, to function smoothly and correctly. Uh, I won't go into the full, maybe I'll have another video, there are videos out there, but uh, you can kind of figure it out using the, the factory service manual. Uh, you have to get a um, an accurate, uh, pretty much a digital uh, ohm meter, and you need to pin out the, uh, the, the different pins inside the throttle position switch and you need feeler gauges that are accurate down to a tenth of a millimeter or a thousandth of an inch. And you need to very, very carefully adjust the throttle position uh, sensor. Uh, additionally, the screws that hold the throttle position sensor to the throttle body uh, are sometimes very, very difficult to, to get off. Uh, especially on a 30-year-old Toyota. Even more important to know is that those screws, which looks which look like Phillips head screws, are not Phillips head screws. Those are Japanese uh, screws, which adhere to the J JIS uh, standard, the Japanese International Standard. And you need a specific screwdriver to properly loosen those. Otherwise, your, a standard Phillips screwdriver will cam out and damage them uh, about half or more of the time. I'll put a link in the video description to the specific screwdrivers that I utilize from Japan for, for those uh, uh, and, and other small bolt uh, screws on, on the truck. So, But I, did, I just wanted to interject... Uh, the importance of having that throttle position sensor uh, properly adjusted because if you don't start there, uh, every almost everything else I cover in this video will probably not really, um, you know, help. Uh, or, or I guess I guess the way to say it would be, uh, if the throttle position sensor is out of adjustment, nothing else I explain to you in this video will will really matter too much as far as trying to make sure it's working if you don't have kind of the crown jewel of the 22RE and that's the throttle position sensor if you don't have it uh, properly adjusted and if you don't ensure with electronic uh, uh, ohm meter that it is functioning within the uh, prescribed parameters then then all other bets are off so all right on with the the video so let's see what else we got here. Um, so these are the intake runners. Uh, the, the intake plenum brings air in through the throttle body, loops it around. Uh, usually uh, these need a little cleaning on an older motor. Um, I think we've covered kind of some of these other things. Right here you can see these are the coolant temperature and the um, cold start timer. You're going to have to kind of look into the manuals to understand some of that stuff. Uh, let's talk a little bit uh, before we wrap things up here about uh, adjusting the valves, okay? Because uh, this the 22RE is a very simple motor uh, and there's a couple things that you want to be aware of. So first and foremost is you've got your, your timing chain here which bolts directly to the, the camshaft. Um, and while it is a chain, Toyota opted to make it a single row chain with the 22RE. I believe the 22R had a dual row. Now, if you go to uh, if you go to um, uh, LC Engineering or 22RE Performance or any any of the large places that sell kind of custom parts for the the motor. Uh, you can pick up the older style dual row timing chain and I, I have a couple of videos that, that covered that when I was rebuilding my motor. Um, I either Pretty much either chain is, is probably going to be okay for most people. I, I run the dual row because I, I want the motor to be a little bit more durable. Uh, the main thing however is that uh, you, you want to check uh, down in here there are some guides okay which help keep tension on the chain and give it a path to go on. You can look at some of my other videos and see those kind of in action, but uh, 
if you do happen to pull the valve cover off to adjust the valves, definitely check to see if either of those are broken. You kind of reach down there with your finger or a screwdriver and wiggle them and see if they move around. Uh, what happens is where they bolt to the front of the block, the, the plastic cracks. And if you have that, uh, you might want to consider upgrading to the dual row chain or at the very least get in there and replace those if you're planning on driving your truck for, for many years uh, like I am. Uh, I feel like the dual row timing chain is, is a good upgrade. I did it on my truck. Um, if, you, if you do uh, have an older truck, you, you might want to give some thought to adjusting the valves, okay? And there's plenty of videos online that show how to do that. Basically, you take a 12 millimeter wrench and you back off this jam nut a little bit and then you take a screwdriver, you twist this little guy here and then you slip a feeler gauge in under the, uh, the clearance between the rocker arm and the top of the, the valve stem. Now, you can find all kinds of information on how to set the valves and should I do it hot or cold, uh, what should I run. Uh, the basic, the shop manual will tell you uh, 12, uh, 12 thousandths on the exhaust and 8 thousandths on the intake. Some people say set them cold, some people say set them hot. I've done them both ways. I'll tell you this much, setting them when the motor's scorching hot is no fun. <laughs> Uh, I've done them both ways. I've run seven thousandths on the intake and eleven thousandths on the exhaust. I've run and I've set them cold, and I've run them. I've 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 uh, brought the truck back when it's hot, yanked off the valve cover, and set them when they're when it's red hot. You know, wearing gloves, and set them to twelve here, and then eight on the exhaust. Uh, excuse me, eight on the intake and twelve here. These days, uh, and and I. I haven't noticed a heck of a lot of difference in, in either method, frankly. Uh, what I will say is that just keeping your valves in adjustment, uh, you will notice that the, the engine runs better, I think. Um, if you have kind of, if you feel that the, the motor missing, misfiring on the road, a lot of times that'll just be one of your valves has kind of crept out of adjustment. And because they're not hydraulic valves, you kind of got to keep on top of it. Um, you know, I adjust my valves probably more than most people. I, I do it every 5,000 miles or so. I just pop the valve cover off and, and check them and run through them real quick. And usually one or two are out of whack. Uh, I think the most I've ever had out of out of adjustment is uh, like one of my exhaust valves for s somehow got from the 12 thousandths that I set it to, you know, like 6 thousandths. Like, what the heck? Uh, I don't know if that was because my my cylinder head was brand new and, and things were wearing in or maybe my cam lows are, are getting wiped. I, who knows? All I know is about every 5,000 or so miles, I, I pull the, the valve cover off and I check my valves and I readjust them and I sleep like a baby that night. <laughs> and and then that makes, generally speaking, that makes the engine run a little bit better. So uh, let's see what else can we say here. Oh, when it comes to spark plugs, uh, Dinzo is the way to go. Um, you can pick them up off Amazon and uh, I'll tell you that a lot of people's problems out there would be cured if they just slapped in a new set of uh, Dinzo uh, 16 heat range plugs. I personally run 14s because I, I like to just have the motor run a little hotter and I also have a kind of a modified electric fan cooling system which keeps the motor running a little cooler so I try to offset the temperature inside the, the chamber with a, with a 14 heat range Denzos but the factory setting is for 16 I think it's W what is it 16 EXR dash U or something you can pick them up on Amazon for a couple bucks a plug now it, you might have noticed in some other videos that I get a little crazy and I grind off the the uh, ground strap and stuff but um, if, you know, for, 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 mo for most people, just gap the plugs around 25 thousandths or, or 32 thousandths and you should be good to go. Um, the other thing is if you have a motor that, you know, if you, if you purchase a truck that, that has got a lot of miles on it, um, it's probably a good idea to do a compression check. And the way you do that, the way you do that is you get yourself a good compression gauge, uh, and you pull all the plugs out. You crank the motor over and you hold the, th the throttle body open and you crank to a count of about eight or 10 and then you, you check the, the, the compression. And you probably wanna have a compression uh, and there's plenty of videos on YouTube that show how to do it and, and everything, but 
just broadly speaking, you want a compression on a 22R, you have probably around 176-ish PSI across all the cylinders. And what you don't want is you don't want one cylinder to be way lower or way higher than the rest. So you kind of want them all to be around uh, a, a, about 176, uh, you know, and you want them all to be within a few a few percentage points of each other. You don't want one to be 10 or 20 percent out of whack. So, for example, if you have you know 165 in one and 176 in another, eh, it's it's probably fine. Maybe there's some carbon buildup or something, or you know maybe there was a little rust in the cylinders. You don't need to run out and rip your motor apart. Now, if you have 175 across all three and one of them is 130, then you might have a problem on your hands. Um, so that's something to check when you first buy your motor. Uh, there's also um, kits you can buy which will allow you to draw. Uh, some of the coolant out and use a chemical process to check to see if you have a, a blown head gasket. Uh, I think that's probably not a bad idea to do if you don't know the history of your motor, just to kind of get, get a feeling. Um, also, on these head bolts, uh, the factory specification is 58 foot-pounds. However, there were technical bulletins later on that came out which uh, said maybe we should run them at 63. I personally run them at 66. So there's a sequence in the shot man which shows how to how to torque them down. As I remember, it's kind of from the the, the middle out and about. Um, you can look it up in in the shot manual. And uh, anytime I do the valves, adjust the valves, I always set my my little snap-on torque wrench to 66 foot pounds, and I just just uh, click down on all these head bolts just to make darn sure that uh, everything is, is tight when it comes to the, the cylinder head. So, Okay, let's see if there's anything else that I maybe could mention that would be beneficial for, for those who are going down the 22RE path. I, I think I've kind of tried to cover, you know, most of the stuff uh, in an effort to just kind of, you know, take away some of the mystery of, you know, what the heck's going on over here. Uh, I will say that I've had real good luck running Valvoline oil. Uh, I know there's, you know, if you really want to get in a big debate on the internet, just start talking about which brand of oil you like. <laughs> but for me, I've been running 5W30 uh, in my 22RE, 5W30 uh, high mileage Valvoline and fully synthetic Valvoline oil. And I've, I've, had really good luck with it uh in the motorcycle and the ferraris and stuff sometimes i've run motul uh i've also run Mo motul in here i've tried just about every oil i've run everything from zero w20 to uh rotex 15 w40 and i've settled on 5w30 as being kind of the best oil for this particular motor now uh also i'll say that the kind of the the, the the mileage that you should be expecting from your 22R E here when everything's running well is um, around 20 city and around 24.5 uh, to 25.0 uh, on on the highway. Granted, I have a, a 20 uh, I have a two wheel drive truck and I've taken some steps to you know reduce the weight and so forth. You can check out some of my other videos and, and see what I'm talking about. Now, one thing I will say, a, a really terrific upgrade for the for this particular uh, generation of truck, uh, if you happen to have this kind of rinky-dink speedometer system with, with no gauges, is look into the SR5 dash upgrade. It's, it's, a, it's a relatively simple upgrade to do, and it will give you a tachometer uh, and the, har the factory harness, for at least the 22 REs, uh, the, you know the fuel injection ones uh, ha already have the wiring, uh, the wire for the tachometer uh, up to the back of the plug on on the dash. So if you get the if you get the SR5, which I I presume comes out of the uh, either a higher trim truck or the Forerunners, um, if you get the what's known as the SR5 dash, you'll get a tachometer, the speedometer, make sure mechanical, you know. And uh, you'll have the gas gauge, the, the oil pressure, the temperature, and the uh, alternator uh, uh, voltage output. So it's a real nice upgrade. 
The only thing you got to be aware of, and I mentioned this in a couple of my other videos, is right here on the, under the starter over here, uh, or not under it, but kind of next to it, uh, or somewhere in there, there's a, a little sending unit that bolts into the, the oil gallery uh, line of the, the oil system, and it has a sending unit which has a, an, a light, like a dummy light. When you switch the dash over, you're going to have to switch that over to the sending unit that goes with it for the SR5. So there's a lot of information out there online, and there's videos and things you can you can uh, track down that will kind of explain all of that. Uh, but it's a terrific upgrade, and if you plan on keeping your truck for a while, um, that's that I, I highly recommend doing that that upgrade. Uh, just to wrap things up here, let's see what do we got here. Um, I guess you know this is power steering, uh, brake stuff. You know, you hopefully you, you kind of already understand all that sort of stuff. Um, the the coil is also something you might want to uh, understand. So the coil has this little module on top, and that's known as an igniter. Okay, and you can look in the electrical wiring diagram to kind of see how that that works. But it's basically you know, triggering a collapse of the primary secondary coil stuff here to get a high voltage. And um, I, and if you see in this particular picture, I have already changed over to aftermarket uh, wires. However, I later uh, switched away from these and I went to the MSD wires. Check any of my recent videos and you can kind of see them. They're, I believe they're the, uh, I want to say nine and a half millimeter. If anyone's curious, I can dig up the, the link for them. I think I got them off of Summit Racing. I also bought a higher output MSD coil and <clears throat> excuse me, and, and I found that to really help matters. Uh, it's uh, The one that I put on was the high vibration one. Uh, I can, I'll see if I can dig up the, the direct link for that. Uh, the other thing I will say with regard to that is if you if you look, let me see if I can find a picture here that shows it. Uh, if you, it's kind of hard to see. You, you can kind of see it in uh, this picture here. So on my particular one, there's a little uh, ground strap that goes from the back of the valve cover to the firewall. Sometimes it goes over to the bolts on the manifold too. But um, what that is, yeah, you can kind of see it back there. What that is, is that's kind of the ground for the motor uh, because don't forget the motor is insulated to a certain degree with the, the motor mounts. And so you have this coil pumping a lot of high voltage through the spark plug wires into the spark plugs, which are in the cylinder head, okay? And the cylinder head is aluminum. Those electrons need to flow somewhere, you know, to get back to the battery. Uh, what I did myself was I ran... And you, you might be able to see in some of my other videos here. Let me see if I can kind of show you. So what I ended up doing to improve the grounding of the of the cylinder head was I actually, uh, I think it was either this bolt or hole or, or this one. I can't remember which. But I got a, a battery, uh, like a four-gauge wire, and uh, rigged it up with with lugs on each side, and I bolted it from the directly from the cylinder head and ran it down to the block, and I uh, I went from uh, as I remember right here and directly bolted it to here to give the uh, motor a little bit more direct route uh, grounding route from from the cylinder head to the cast iron block, and then the cast iron block, of course, uh, goes directly from one of the grounding bolts over here back to the battery. And I will say that that, uh, I did notice that when I did that, the motor seemed to run a little sharper uh, as far as, you know, oops, uh, as far as across the board, idling and, and, and acceleration and things. Uh, could have been my imagination, I don't know, but uh, it sure seemed like when I grounded out the cylinder had a little bit better to the block, uh, above and beyond what you get right here from the factory, it sure seemed like the motor started to run a little bit more crisp uh, with acceleration and idling and things like that. So, all right, well, I think since we're at an hour and a half here, uh, we'll wrap things up. Uh, like I say, this is kind of uh, 
the state of my truck when I first got it. Uh, I'm not sure what the full story was, but um, it's it's been a long kind of interesting adventure, and I just wanted, like I said, to kind of uh, provide sort of a video for someone, you know, for anyone who's just got their just bought their 22 re or maybe is thinking of you know maybe it'd be cool to have an older more reliable pickup truck i just kind of wanted to cover uh kind of an overview of, of what you know kind of what are the major things going on here to just kind of give you uh like i say kind of a a more broad picture of what you're up against uh the motor the 22 re is a, is a beautiful simplistic kind of engine it's very reliable um and uh it, it's uh well, it's not the smoothest motor ever uh, created. It is a it is a very easy to to maintain and uh, enjoyable motor to work on. And as long as you don't have any major failures like head gaskets or blowing or anything like that, it's uh, it's really a terrific little truck to to own and and enjoy. So, uh, like I said, I wanted to kind of just cover kind of some of the stuff there uh, to help people out if they if they've. Uh, purchased a, a Toyota with a 22 RE. All right, so thanks for watching. Uh, as always, you know, if you have any questions, specific questions, um, uh, feel free to post a comment or, or, or anything on the section below. I, I do try to keep up with all the, the questions and comments, and, and when people have questions, I always try to help out and give a thorough, as thorough of an answer as I can uh, based on the knowledge I, I have of this particular motor. So if you if you are struggling with something or you're in the dark, um, you know, happy to field any any of the questions I can. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed the video. Uh, maybe you'll consider uh, subscribing. We're getting dangerously close to 5,000 subscribers, which uh, is really great. I really appreciate everybody on the channel. Um, and uh, of course, you can also turn on the notifications. Not all my videos are 22RE related. I will say I'm in the process of restoring a, a vintage typewriter. Um, so there may be some videos coming about that. Uh, as soon as I get down to my new, my new place where I'm going to be living, uh, I'm going to be getting a new espresso machine. So for the guys still on the channel hanging in there, uh, there is a new espresso machine coming. I don't know when, and I don't know what, but I'm kind of leaning towards a, uh, a, a La San Marco kind of hybrid sort of custom thing. I'm looking around for that lever as I, as we speak. So, uh, and anything else that comes up on the channel, you know, uh, uh, I'll post it. Uh, I've been thinking about maybe doing some stock market stuff and maybe some health stuff, but uh, I got to get kind of my house sold first. But in any event, thanks for watching the 22RE overview. I hope you've enjoyed it, and uh, we'll see you in the next one.